Those who can't do, teach. I'm sure you have heard this saying. It sums up Galileo's role in the history of scientific thought, in my opinion. Galileo's books are science for dummies. He drones on and on about elementary principles of scientific method because he lacks the mathematical ability to do anything more advanced than that. It is precisely because he is so bad at mathematics that he is forced to waste so many words doing something so trivial. Galileo was not much of a mathematician, but he knew a thing or two about rhetoric. He saw a way to make a virtue out of necessity. He realized uh, very well that uh, he could not hold a candle to Archimedes, so he chose to play a different sport. He went after Aristotelian philosophers instead. Sure enough, uh, he scores many points against these fools, but that's fish in a barrel. Here's what Descartes said about Galileo. He is eloquent to refute Aristotle, but that is not hard. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Descartes, he is the nail on the head right there. If Descartes had a podcast, you know, I wouldn't have to uh, make mine. But, so the point is, relative to the philosophers, Galileo is a big step forward. Yes, that's true. But relative to the mathematicians, he's just saying obvious things that everyone had already known for thousands of years. Uh, Descartes, he continued in the same vein. I see nothing in his books to make me envious and hardly anything I should wish to avow mine. And Galileo's mathematical demonstrations in particular did not impress uh, Descartes. He did not need to be a great geometer to discover those, that's what Descartes says. That's right on the money. Uh, do you think uh, my take on Galileo is uh, crazy and unbalanced? Well, then you think uh, Descartes is crazy too, because he agreed with me, and so did other mathematically competent people at that time. And people who knew Archimedes and so on, unlike many who write on Galileo today, who are less well-versed in classical mathematical authors. Galileo's uh, claim to fame, it rests on the assumption that Archimedes does not exist, basically, and that everyone but Galileo was a raving Aristotelian. Galileo himself went out of his way to ensure this framing. His two big books, they're both uh, dialogues. One character is a mouthpiece for Galileo, and another is an Aristotelian uh, simpleton. Well, this is the, uh, the contrast class that Galileo wants us to use when evaluating his achievements. And uh, no wonder, of course, refuting Aristotle is not hard, as Descartes said. Of course, Galileo, he can score some singers against this feeble uh, opposition. Galileo, he tries to pass himself off as a rebel truth-teller, taking on supposedly all-pervasive Aristotelian establishment. Well, if one buys into this deceptive framing then one may very well come away with the impression that uh, Galileo did something of value. Uh, but no, Galileo has rigged the game. He has pitted himself against a convenient punching bag. Uh, let's listen to this quote. The philosophers of our times philosophize as men of no intellect and little better than absolute fools. That's Galileo, and he's right. Fools, a lot of them, uh, those philosophers. But Galileo was not the only one to see this. Descartes, for example, said of the Aristotelians that they were less knowledgeable than if they had abstained from study. So Galileo's claim to fame is that he refuted people who were less knowledgeable than if they had abstained from study. That's hardly the pinnacle of intellectual achievement. And another example, Tycho Brahe. He was a leading astronomer some decades before uh, Galileo, a rather a conservative guy, really. And uh, he too complained about uh, the oppressive authority of Aristotle, as he called it. Aristotle's individual words are worshipped as though they were those of the Delphic Oracle, he writes. Now, though this was the kind of attitude that was uh, universal among mathematicians. There's no use uh, writing several thick books uh, hammering home just this point and very little else. That's basically what Galileo does. And, and that's just uh, 
beating a dead horse as far as the mathematicians are concerned. Mathematicians have always had a clear sense of uh, us versus them in this respect, the mathematicians versus the philosophers. It's remarkable how they have complete faith in the judgment of other mathematicians and utter contempt for everyone else. This attitude is everywhere in Galileo's time and also before, uh, probably older than Greek times for, for all we know. Uh, consider uh, Copernicus, for instance. That's a hundred years before Galileo. And here's what uh, Copernicus says when he introduces his theory that uh, the sun is in the center of the solar system. I have no doubt that talented and learned mathematicians will agree with me. For I will, he says, make everything clearer than they, at least for those who are not ignorant of the art of mathematics. And uh, what about those who are ignorant of mathematics? Well, he addresses them as well, and here's what he says. If perchance there are certain idle talkers, wholly ignorant of mathematics, there to who dare to attack my work, they worry me so little that I shall scorn their judgments. These are the kinds of people who, on account of their natural stupidity, hold the position among philosophers that drones hold among bees. The studious need not be surprised if people like that laugh at us. Mathematics is written for mathematicians. This is all Copernicus's words from the introduction to his great uh, masterpiece, his big book on the revolution of heavenly bodies. Um, he, he doesn't uh, mean uh, words, does he? In, it's the same in uh, Kepler, Galileo's uh, contemporary. Let all the skilled mathematicians of Europe come forward, he implores. Evidently, he has uh, complete confidence that uh, mathematical reason compels all of them to speak uh, with uh, one voice. Uh, like Copernicus, Kepler also addresses the non-mathematicians. Oh, in his great masterpiece, the Astronomia Nova, he has a section in the introduction with the heading Advice for Idiots. These are his words. And there he says uh, things like Whoever is too stupid to understand astronomical science, I advise him that he mind his own business and scratch in his own dirt patch. Uh, this is uh, the Kepler's words, and it's all written before Galileo has published anything. So mathematically competent people were united, and they had nothing but contempt for Aristotelian philosophy and, and such things. By the time Galileo comes along and belabors this point at great length, it has been old news for hundreds of years. You gotta admire the guts of these people, in my opinion. These quotes that I mentioned from Copernicus and Kepler, they're from their scientific masterpieces, not a passing remark in confidential personal correspondence to kind of blow off steam. or something. And it's not a reply to a specific provocation. It's not something said in the heat of the moment or anything like that. No, they decided to put this advice for idiots right at the heart of their scientific masterpieces, these crowning accomplishments that were written for the ages. Galileo joked about his lack of tact, as he called it, and uh, he was not alone in this. Mathematicians of this age were not much for tact. The presence of good tone means the absence of good sense, says Schopenhauer, and mathematicians of Galileo's time, they had a lot of good sense. This has always been the way of the mathematician, in fact. Just imagine uh, today a philosopher walking into a mathematics department, uh, starting telling them what to do, or how to think. Of course, no mathematician listens to that. Uh, not today, not in Galileo's time, or not ever. In, in antiquity, you have Ptolemy, for example, the astronomer. Here's what he has to say. Only mathematics can provide sure and unshakable knowledge. Other divisions of theoretical philosophy should rather be called guesswork than knowledge. So mathematicians have always taken this kind of stuff for granted. And that's why, from a mathematical point of view, Galileo is nobody. He did little else than provide redundant proofs of this uh, self-evident truth. I'm going to offer now a conspiracy theory of sorts. As we have seen, Galileo, he needs us to assume that Aristotelianism and philosophy was the state of scientific knowledge in his day. 
and that no one had ever heard of Archimedes, basically. Only then does his so-called accomplishments uh, come off looking any good. Ask yourself, who is inclined to go along with such an assumption? I will tell you who. Someone who doesn't know any Archimedes, but is very comfortable with Aristotle and other philosophers. People from the humanities, in other words. So, Galileo is in luck. He needs an audience with certain blind spots and predispositions, and he gets exactly that. Modern academia is set up in his favor. History of science nowadays, it is a humanities field. The default uh, training of historians of science is not higher mathematics or physics. It is reading seminars based on non-mathematical authors, such as Aristotle. So the people tasked with uh, being Galileo experts are by design the people most inclined to accept Galileo's uh, deceit. Pretending that Archimedes doesn't exist serves both their purposes and Galileo's. They share Galileo's aversion to proper mathematics, so they are more than happy to write off Archimedes as, yes, a genius to be sure, but a very specialized one who's just doing some esoteric math stuff that uh, doesn't really matter to the history and philosophy of science. Um, I try to quantify this a bit. The History of Science Society publishes an annual bibliography of works in the history of science. I thought I would use it to compare Aristotle and Archimedes. I compiled the number of entries for the past 15 years and I found the following. Uh, Archimedes has 42 entries. That's 42 books and articles written about Archimedes in the past 15 years. Aristotle has 482 entries. That's well over 10 times as many as Archimedes. This uh, concerns uh, Aristotle's role in the history of science only. You should take care to note. It's not counting works on Aristotle altogether. Of course, there are many thousands more of those. And in fact, the ratio in favor of Aristotle should be doubled. The, the, the bibliography of history of science works also has another 339 works on Aristotelianism. So basically uh, dogmatic followers of Aristotle. And there were many of those in the, the Middle Ages and even still in Galileo's time. And they get uh, a lot of attention. There has never been any entry on Archimedianism in the bibliography. If you're writing one, you know, count me in as a reader, because we need such scholarship. Anyway, so that's 20 times as many works on Aristotelian thought as on Archimedes. And what do you expect? If you put the history of science in the hands of humanities people, uh, that's what they're going to do. In fact, how could they do otherwise? Uh, suppose I'm right. Suppose that the 20 to 1 ratio in favor of Aristotle over Archimedes is foolish and it distorts the true nature of the development of scientific thought. Suppose, uh, for the sake of argument, that I'm right about that. Even so, the humanities people, they could not very well say so, even if they believed it. They couldn't say it. It, it would, if they did, it would basically amount to saying, oh, please don't give us any more money for research. Uh, you, you trusted us to study the development of scientific thought, but uh, we came to the conclusion that actually the, the history of science is best understood from a scientific and mathematical point of view rather than the, the philosophical background that we have. So therefore, please give your research money to, to those people instead, to the science departments. Please fire half of the people in my department because there's already way too much work uh, being done on Aristotle. Well, they're not going to say that, are they? Even if they believed it, they would be fools to say that. So the way modern historical scholarship is set up plays right into Galileo's hands. And actually, that is true in more ways than one. So a heavy bias... Uh, toward philosophy, away from mathematics, that's one thing. But here's another. Uh, contextualism versus universalism. 
the, the issue, you might say, comes down to this. Do great minds think alike? I say, yes, they do. I say there is a kind of spiritual unity of scientific thought from ancient to modern times. I say that what is obvious to us was obvious to the Greeks. I say that it is ludicrous to think that generations of Greek mathematical geniuses of the first order, with their extensively documented interest in science, they all somehow fail to conceive basic principles of scientific method. I say all of this because I kind of feel it in my bones, so to speak. Uh, I have spent my life in mathematics departments. I have experienced so many times this profound sense of thinking exactly alike with another person, uh, young or old, student or professor. When we talk about mathematics, our minds are one. Mathematics, it has this power to make brethren of us all. This is why Copernicus and Kepler had such unshakable confidence that mathematicians would agree with them. For the same reason, Galileo says with conviction that uh, if Aristotle were now alive, I had no doubt that he would change his opinion. Uh, this is the historiographical outlook of mathematicians. The idea that uh, modern science was born in a Galilean revolution, on the other hand, is based on seeing history as soaked in uh, cultural relativism. Following this school of thought, you must approach ancient texts as if they were mysterious uh, communiques from an alien life form on the other side of the universe. You must banish any notion of unity in human thought and instead view old and new as worlds apart, uh, separated by a conceptual abyss that no intuition can bridge. This is the worldview and historiographical approach of many who are far removed from mathematics. From this point of view, it is completely natural to think that basic principles of scientific methods that seem so obvious to us uh, today were in fact once completely outside the conceptual universe of even extremely sophisticated mathematical scientists like Archimedes. And so this is why Galileo is the idol of the humanists and the bane of the mathematicians. The philosophers say he invented modern science and the mathematicians say that he's a poor man's Archimedes. That's, this highlights how this issue cuts much deeper than just uh, allotting credit to one century or the other. It's much more than a question of the detailed chronology of obscure scientific uh, facts. It is a question of uh, worldview. It's a question of how one should approach and understand history. I say that the traditional view of the Galilean scientific revolution is not only historically wrong, but it's fundamentally inconsistent with the nature of mathematical thought. When I say Galileo, boo, Archimedes, yay, my, my point is not, uh, you know, who was the first or who should get credit for this or that. That's not so interesting. But Galileo, he is a window into more important things. What is the relation between mathematics and science? Uh, was mathematics before Galileo just a technical enterprise, compartmentalized, limited to certain computational tasks, blind to its own potential as a tool for studying nature? Was mathematics stuck in that ditch until it was liberated by a conceptual breakthrough from without, so to speak, from philosophy? Or was mathematics always an expansive, empirically informed, interconnected study of all quantifiable aspects of the world. Uh, if you ask me, it's the latter, of course, of these two options. And in any case, Galileo is ground zero for grappling with these questions, and that is why we study him. Thank you.